Support for this program is provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. Hello and welcome to Louisiana Public Square. I'm LSU media law professor Craig Freeman. Since oil was first discovered in the state over 110 years ago, Louisiana and the oil and gas industry have shared a symbiotic relationship. The industry depends on the natural resources of the state for its profits and the state relies on the income stream from the industry to function. But as the energy sector's contribution to the state's coffers has decreased from 40 to 17 percent over the last two decades, many people are re-examining what they see as an imperfect union. A recent lawsuit by Levy Authority in South Louisiana says the oil and gas industry has been battering coastal marshlands for years, putting storm and flood protection at risk. Energy supporters say their dredging activities were legal and the lawsuit and similar suits are driving investors away. So how much responsibility does the energy sector bear for Louisiana's environmental challenges? And are recent lawsuits legitimate efforts for compensation or attempts to kill the state's golden goose? Tonight, Louisiana Public Square explores energy's environmental footprint. Every time that I fly out over the Gulf, I find a new leak or spill of some sort. Jonathan Henderson works with the Gulf Restoration Network. Following the BP oil spill in 2010, his group and other Louisiana environmental nonprofits pool their talent and limited resources to form the Gulf Monitoring Consortium. Through satellite images, aerial photography, and on the water observation, the group scans for oil leaks in the Gulf. Well, what our organizations have learned, um, especially um, in the aftermath of the BP disaster, is that the, um, the the number of incidents is, is, is not being uh, communicated to the public and the size of the incidents is being vastly underreported under by the companies themselves. Internal BP emails show that the company originally estimated 5,000 barrels were leaking each day from the Deepwater Horizon rig when it knew up to 20 times more may have been released. The spill ultimately polluted 125 miles of Louisiana's 400-mile coastline. Henderson says this is just one example of the damage to Louisiana caused by the oil and gas industry. All one has to do is, you know, go, go out um, on a boat or a plane and look around and you can see their footprint. Among the industry's environmental impacts in the state, the Louisiana Oil Spill Coordinator's Office, created in the wake of the Alaska Valdez oil spill, estimates that about 330,000 gallons, 20 percent of all the oil spilled in the nation annually, leaks from Louisiana facilities. At the height of the Haynesville shale activity in North Louisiana, natural gas explorers were pumping wells dry as part of their fracking process, forcing the Department of Natural Resources to issue a water use advisory. And in 2012, an abandoned salt dome in northern Assumption Parish, mined previously for brine used by the petrochemical industry, collapsed forcing the evacuation of 350 Bayou Corn residents. It has cost the state nearly $10 million to investigate. Twelve other domes around the state could be at equal risk. But it's along the state's coastlines where the energy sector's environmental footprint is most visible, where thousands of miles of dredged canals bisect the marshland. Oliver Houck teaches environmental law at Tulane. The oil and gas industry has through its exploration and development process, torn up the marshes that separate the city from the Gulf. And without those marshes in place, the Gulf comes in more viciously, higher volume, higher damage every year. In July, the Southeast Louisiana Flood Protection Authority, East, filed a lawsuit against 97 oil, gas, and pipeline companies, arguing that the land loss caused by the company's actions has left coastal residents more vulnerable to storms and flooding. It's a sham. 
Senator Robert Adley is a Republican from Benton who is a consultant to the natural gas industry. Like Governor Bobby Jindal, Adley says that the levy board doesn't have the authority to file the lawsuit. He also feels that since the companies received state permits to dredge canals, it's unfair to target them. You're saying to people that did not violate the law that I'm going to punish you and sue you because the agreement you made with the state of Louisiana, you kept your agreement, you did what you were told to do, but we don't like the outcome, so we're going to sue you because you have a lot of money. Critics say the relationship between the state and the oil and gas industry is too cozy. They point to evidence like a Times-Picayune article showing that of 4,500 oil and gas permits over a five-year period, not one was denied by the permitting agency. What's ultimately permitted is, can be very different from uh, what's applied for. Keith Lovell is Assistant Secretary in the Department of Natural Resources Coastal Management Office. He says by working with permit applicants, potential impacts to the state coastal resources are generally avoided prior to approval. On an annual basis, we save about a thousand acres uh, of, of wetlands and coastal resources through our permit review process. And that's not the acres that we ultimately have to mitigate. Those are acres that are conserved. If environmental damage is unavoidable, which Lovell says happens to less than 100 acres a year, it must be fully mitigated. For Professor Hauk, the devil is in the details. The state considers this mitigated if at the end of the uh, process you put up a little wooden barrier at the edge of the canal so the salt water doesn't come in. Well, as anyone who fishes coastal Louisiana knows, the carve out behind those barriers is automatic. Boats just speed by them. The water speeds by them. The salt water comes in through them. Um, the, the, the canal collapses. The marsh collapses. These lawsuits are not about the environment. They are not about the environment. They're about greedy trial lawyers. Don Briggs is president of the Louisiana Oil and Gas Association. He puts the blame for coastal land loss on the levee system for preventing the flow of sediment into the wetlands. Briggs also says that due to an increase in environmental lawsuits in the past several years, drilling in the state has declined, approaching its lowest point in the past decade. Companies have the right and the ability to invest and drill anywhere they want to drill. You know, right now they're drilling in Texas, they're having a boom, they're drilling in Oklahoma, they're having a boom, they're drilling in Midland, they're drilling in the, you know, the Bakken up in North Dakota, and our account is doing this, and it's because of these lawsuits. No matter what the future holds for the levy authorities' lawsuit, oil and gas companies also have a stake in Louisiana's vanishing coast. As more wetlands disappear, the billions of dollars of critical energy infrastructure will be exposed. In the meantime, Henderson's Gulf Monitoring Consortium will continue to police the industry along the coast. Our hope um, collectively is that over the long term, the awareness that we're raising about ongoing pollution incidents will lead to you know, stricter regulations on the industry, a deeper understanding by the public and by decision makers that there's a lot more polluting going on than, than people really know about. Well, joining us here in our studio are residents from the greater Baton Rouge area, including representatives from Southern University, LSU, and environmental and industry groups. We also have two members from the Legislative Youth Advisory Council from Alexandria. LSU's Public Policy Research Lab surveyed citizens around the state on tonight's topic. Among the survey responses, when asked how important they think the oil and gas industry is to the state, of those responding, 81% said extremely important, and 18% said somewhat important. When asked if environmental lawsuits are driving investors and businesses away from Louisiana, 43% of those surveyed agree, 30% disagree, and 27% were unsure. Of those expressing an opinion about what bears the most responsibility for coastal land loss, 27% say natural erosion from waves, 25% blame hurricane activity, 22% point to oil and gas industry activity, while 13% say activity by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is responsible. And when asked how much responsibility the Louisiana energy sector bears for the state's environmental challenges, an equal percentage of respondents, 33%, say the sector bears most of or some of the responsibility. 
21% say the energy industry bears the majority of the responsibility, while just 5% think the sector bears, bears very little of the responsibility. And so let's start there. Is the oil and gas industry doing more harm than good or more good for the state? Ainsley, what do you think? I think it's doing more good for the state than harm. With everything that you do, there's going to be positive and negative outcomes. Although we're looking at mostly the negative outcomes, there are many jobs that are created by this. It's 17% of the jobs and the income that come from the oil industry. And if that was eliminated, then that would not be something that's pumped into our own economy. And that would be taken away and it would hurt our own public and local economies and it would be really bad. Trey, do you agree? I do agree, honestly. Um, the oil and gas industry holds about 17% of Louisiana's economy. It brings in a lot of jobs, about 800,000 jobs and is just very beneficial to not only the people but also the economy as a whole. I think instead of focusing on pushing the oil and gas industry away from Louisiana, we should focus on moderating the regulations in a way that is appealing to the companies but also looks after the environment a little bit more than we're currently looking after it. Mike, what do you think? Well, I just agree. First of all, I think the claims about the size of the industry in the state are overstated. In 2010, when there was a deep water drilling moratorium, all these claims were made about the impact, devastating impact that was going to have on the state. But in Lafayette Parish, which was predicted to have up to 10 percent unemployment, sales tax collections were up, unemployment never, never fell. It rose all year long. I think that uh, the problem with the industry has is that they don't want to pay anything now. In the, in, the, in the northwest part of the state, in the Haynesville trend, with the exemption on severance taxes, the state got very little money out of all that natural gas that was pumped out of there. And as a result of that, we're not getting the feel-good story that the, of the industry, what they did for our state, is being undercut by the fact that they're not having to pay the taxes that they used to pay on oil and gas drilled in the state. Sydney, what do you think? I agree with Mike, is that the, the oil industry, it's not that we're trying to kill the business. We want to continue the, continue the land, but we also have to look at their environment and the other impact that they're having on the, inf the kinds of destruction that was created by, on the coast. Uh, we have created more jobs by helping to restore the coast because if we lose that ecology and we lose that protection, those things help to distribute uh, sediment if we have a place to capture it. And we, yeah, we, we, we stop the, the river from overflowing, but storms do re deposit sediments that's put offshore. So it, we have jobs that can be created by re recreating our shorelines. And so it, 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 we're talking about jobs, but Salvador, what do you think? I mean, what's well, the best way? You know, the, the percentages are kind of skewed. While, yes, the, the percentage of oil and gas jobs may have gone from 40% to 17%, Louisianians are pretty resilient in the fact that even during the 85 bust and the BP incident, we didn't put all of our eggs in one basket. Lafayette is not as dependent as it used to be on simply oil and gas. So the diversification of the economy has something to do with the fact that the, we weren't as impacted as some other parts of the country or other parts of the state were. And in, the, in regard to the severance tax exemptions about the Haynesville Shale, many of those wells were plugged for future utility just because when they were drilled, gas was at $9 in MCF, and shortly thereafter it went down to under $3 in MCF, which really didn't pro provide much of a market for natural gas. Well, I think we're talking about <coughs> coastal restoration, and that was the lawsuit is about to clean up essentially the mess that you've made. If you have were issued a permit by DNR and you were supposed to reclaim the property and clean it up, and put it back to the way it was, then you need to abide by that contract. That was a contract between the people and the state for letting you use our natural resources. Willie, do you um, know a little bit about the, the, that process? Are we getting back um, to the place that we were before the companies came here? We're not even close. <clears throat> the oil and gas industry has dumped billions of uh, gallons and barrels and pounds of toxic and hazardous materials in our coast, for instance, just naturally occurring salt water that comes up with oil and gas is anywhere from five to seven times more saline or salty than seawater. And when that water is discharged into local waterways or canals, 
it kills all of the benthos, or bottom-dwelling organisms. That's not counted by anybody. And the oil and gas industry has had, oh, I don't know, about 100,000 uh, flow meters for natural gas, and there's still thousands of them in use today. Each of those meters contains um, a liter of mercury, and a liter of mercury is enough to contaminate all of the aquatic species in Lake Pontchartrain. But there are thousands of those that have been lost across Louisiana, and, and it's contaminated lots of our waterways. And the state and the industry have never dealt with that problem. And there are all these residual pollution. I, I, I don't need to go into them. But I mean, there are lots of problems out there that have not been dealt with by the, the industry, by the state, or by the federal government. Now, David, do you think that lawyers are the way to solve <coughs> this? Is that the, the way we get to some resolution? Uh, absolutely not. The, it, the timing of this, this particular issue in this suit is, is somewhat strange because you, you are seeing a, a lack of investment or slowing down of investment in the Louisiana oil and gas industry. Royalties are being lost. And to have especially a contingency-based suit, uh, the motivation is different. Uh, this should have been, and there's all kind of culpability in this, on this issue, but uh, it should have been progressively addressed for solution-based, as a solution-based uh, problem. There's all these ideas out there, but yet is, is there a master plan for if and when, say, the proceeds from any of these occur, then what are you going to do? If, the, if you're chasing the car, what's going to happen once you catch it? Latoya, what do you think? Latasha, I'm sorry. I don't think it's black and white. Um, but I do think that the industry should um, be held accountable for some degree of damage. Um, we can look at jobs currently, but we have to look in the long term at our coast. And once we lose it, it's you know difficult to replenish. So I think um, it's not black and white. Eric, we've got to get to some solution. I mean, what do we do? Uh, I think at the end of the end of the day, it comes down to responsibility. Um, if the oil and gas industries are responsible for some of the losses, uh, then I think that they should take it upon themselves to uh, provide investments for restoration. If that doesn't happen, uh, I'm not sure if the lawsuit is the best way, but I think uh, that there should still be some accountability held. But at the same time, I think that the state and re uh, local regulators have to be held accountable as well and take responsibility for uh, the missteps and the uh, mismanagement of these different types of permits and uh, restoration practices. Mike, who's responsible? How do we hold people responsible? Well, I think the first part of the issue is that we are a petrocolonial state. The oil and gas industry controls our political process. The Department of Natural Resources is a captive agency of the industry. The idea that they're regulating that industry is just not true. Uh, when the legislative fiscal auditor came out with a report in December that said when severance tax collection was shifted from the Department of Revenue to the Department of Natural Resources, they did not audit severance taxes for at least two years. We lost hundreds of millions of dollars because, because this agency had no interest in actually regulating the industry that they supposedly regulate, did, did not collect the taxes. This is how, again, the feel-good story is being undermined by the behavior of the industry themselves, insisting on exemptions or not paying taxes that, that are due. Well, I think we're going to be able to get some answers soon on uh, who should be responsible and maybe getting uh, some, some accountability for some of the, the, the losses that we've had over the years. That's all the time we have for this portion of our show. When we return, we'll be joined by a panel of experts to further explore energy's environmental footprint. Welcome back to Louisiana Public Square. Tonight, we're discussing energy's environmental footprint in the state. Joining us now is our panel of experts. John Barry is an award-winning author who served on the Southeast Louisiana Flood Protection Authority, East, from 2007 until 2013. He was the chief architect of the board's lawsuit against the oil and gas industry. He is currently president of the nonprofit group Restore Louisiana Now. Senator Norbert Chabert is a Republican from Homa who has been serving in District 20 in Terrebonne and Lafourche parishes since 2009. The committees he serves on include the Senate Finance, Natural Resources, and the Senate Select Committee on Coastal Restoration and Flood Control. Since 2002, Foster Campbell has served as the state's public service commissioner for District 5 in North Louisiana. 
Prior to his position with the PSC, he was a state senator for 27 years and is an outspoken advocate for processing tax on the oil and gas industry. Keith Hall is the director of the Louisiana Mineral Law Institute and a professor of energy law at LSU. He is a member of the board of editors for the Oil and Gas Reporter and practiced law for 16 years prior to coming to LSU. Before we go to our audience for questions, if you could each briefly tell me whether you feel the energy sector has positively or negatively affected the state. We'll start with you, Professor. Without a doubt, the impact has been positive. The oil and gas industry provides thousands of jobs, pays millions of taxes, pays a lot in royalties to landowners. Uh, it's partly because of the oil and gas industry. We have the petrochemical industry, which provides many more jobs in Louisiana. And the oil and gas industry provides products that we use literally every day, in fact, almost every hour of our lives. Gasoline, diesel, plastics, all kinds of products that we would not be able to have modern life without. Mr. Foster? Well, well of course, I think the oil and gas industry has been positive for Louisiana. But I want to say they've done a lot of damage, too. And I'm like Willie over here. I heard his statement a while ago. Our problem in Louisiana is we've had too many politicians do it with too many tap dancing shoes on when it comes to public policy. We let them get away with a lot of things they shouldn't have got away with. We ought to have a state where the politicians have a, a rigid uh, 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 regulations, and we ought to, we, you're going to invite them to come here, but we ought to make them clean up the mess they've created. It's just that simple. We've been very lax on the oil companies, and now we find a coast that's been eroded. And everybody knows they've caused some of the problems, and they ought to have to fix it up. Senator? Well, certainly the oil and gas industry has been very positive for Louisiana. Uh, you know, electricity doesn't necessarily come out of the socket. It's got to come from somewhere. Uh, as the uh, gentleman from LSU had stated earlier, there are so many products that are, that are it, on our persons right now that are directly responsible of oil and gas exploration done in this state and right off our coast. Uh, you know, our economy in Louisiana right now is very much an oil and gas service economy. Thousands of jobs, as was previously stated, uh, billions in taxes paid. Is um, the entirety of the coast eroding because of oil and gas uh, exploration and production? Absolutely not. That's ludicrous. Uh, I represent two coastal parishes in my Senate district. I've grown up on the coast. I got elected because, you know, saltwater intrusion and hurricane storm surges caused flooding in my house. That's why I'm here to serve the people of the state of Louisiana. But I'm not here to blame the oil and gas industry for doing that. If there's anybody, one of the disturbing things I saw earlier was that statue showed up where only 13% of the citizens of this state blame the U.S. Corps of Engineers for coastal erosion. That's a terrible uh, problem. Mr. Beck? Uh, well, like everybody else here, obviously I feel the industry has done good. Uh, like a lot of people in the state, I used to work for the industry. I actually won an award from one of the defendants. Uh, but I think it's important that the industry obey the law. Uh, state law since 1980 has required them to fix the damage that they cause on the coast. Uh, the permits that they uh, are issued are contracts, just like a contract, and they also require them to fix what they destroy. The, 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 la the language is, is something like uh, uh, detoxify, revegetate, uh, return as close as practicable to the original condition. Clearly, the industry has not done that. Clearly, the industry is responsible for an enormous amount of the land loss. Not all of it by any stretch. Uh, but the State Department of Natural Resources, the state, in 2006, concluded that in part of the Baratarian and Terrebonne Basins, 76% of the land loss is the responsibility of the industry. Uh, for all of southeast Louisiana, uh, the U.S. Geological Survey, including scientists from Exxon, Amoco, and other uh, industry uh, partners, uh, concluded that 36% of the land loss was the responsibility of the industry. And all of that land loss was was conducted under state law and permits that required them to fix what they broke. They have not done it. All the lawsuit seeks to get is for them to obey Louisiana law just like everyone else in this room has to do. Now, David, before we start to talk about what happened in the past, you had a question about kind of a master plan. Right. That's We, we tend to 
to do these types of things and, and, and start placing blame and trying to resolve the blame issue of it. But in, in the end, uh, this problem's been around for a long time. And is there any, or has anyone made effort to produce a master plan for, as opposed to just dumping money into the project or, or dumping money onto the state, which is just as bad as not getting severance tax and letting them do with what they will? Well, I mean, I served on the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority for, for six years. There is a master plan. It was passed unanimously by the legislature. Uh, it was praised by environmentalists and scientists. Uh, there is no money for the master plan. It is a $50 billion plan to stabilize land loss, but it would cost $100 billion to actually gain any land. Uh, the, and the purpose of the lawsuit was designed to actually pay to fund the master plan projects. We have no money. It's a 50 bill, there's a hole of $47 billion. Now, the industry was not sued because they have deep pockets. The industry was sued because they broke the law. They broke state law. It was not enforced by the state. That's true because of the political muscle of the industry. Uh, their contracts required them to pay and, and you know, finally someone is asking them to obey the law and what happens, the industry and the governor say, let's go to the legislature, we're above the law, we're going to have the legislature kill the lawsuit because we don't want to go to court. That is totally inappropriate and I think should offend everybody whether you uh, agree with the lawsuit or disagree with the lawsuit. It should be decided by evidence, by science, and by the courts. Professor, I saw you nodding your head. You, you well, let me say please. something about Commissioner. Could. Let me give you a little history here, uh, and that's a real good question here because a lot of people ask me that all the time. Well, if you got all this money, politicians in Baton Rouge, you just squander it. That's what they think. There was a lawsuit once when I was in the legislature, a uh, tobacco lawsuit, and then Governor Mike Foster was against the lawsuit. His, his deal was nobody has to smoke, okay? <laughs> well, then guess who was the head of DHH at that particular time? Bobby Jindal. Mm -hmm. And he was the head of the hospitals then. Anybody ought to know about smoking, emphysema, heart problems, cancer of the lungs, should have been Bobby Jindal. But Bobby Jindal joined Mike Foster to not to sue the tobacco companies. Glad we didn't listen to both of them. We sued them. We got four billion. The big deal now, I saw Mr. Briggs say, this is just a grab by the trial lawyers. Uh, the trial lawyers got us four billion for tobacco problems and we needed it because we took care of poor people at all the hospitals, Conway, the Shreveport Hospital, Earl Long, Big Charity in New Orleans. We took care of them because we love the people and we don't want them to suffer. So we sued them, we got four billion. Now if these companies cause damage, which I think they have, they need suing. They need suing. And when you sue them and you get the money, there's all kinds of plans we can work together to restore our coast. I live in North Louisiana, in Bossier Parish. There is no coastal erosion in Bossier Parish. <laughs> I, I'll tell you that. But I've watched this for years and years and years, and I see the hold that the oil companies have on the legislature. It is a chokehold. And every time we try to do something, there's always a reason not to do it. Believe it or not, the only guy that really ever tried to restore the coast in my terms was Dave Treen, who was a Republican. Mm -hmm. He had coastal wetland environmental levy. Guess what they did to Dave Treen? The oil companies were not for Dave Treen when he ran again, although they were for him when he ran. They were for another fellow we all know, Edwin Edwards beat Dave Treen. But they went right back to Edwin Edwards. So the idea that, that oil companies, uh, big lawsuits, I'm for lawsuits. Sometimes people need to it. Professor, what do you think? Well, the, the, the scientists say that the canals play a role. But they also say that a lot of other things are involved. And in fact, the plaintiff's lawyers only allege that 36% of the responsibility is <laughs> oil and gas industry activity. They say that 64%, nearly two-thirds of the responsibility is other causes. So they're going to obviously want to put the best uh, spin on their case. And they're saying nearly two-thirds is responsibility of things other than the oil and gas industry. To the extent there have been any uh, failures to abide by permits, certainly the permit should be enforced. But most of the, but there was a suggestion there's been some widespread failure to abide by permits and enforce the law. The plaintiff's petition talks about coastal erosion going back to the 1930s and oil and gas activity in the early 1900s. It's been 
only a small fraction of that time, relatively recently, that the permits have started being written to require that the canals be filled in. So most of that well, that's not Partially actually third, accurate. Uh, ac that, no, it's you certainly since 1980, actually, the, the state the law. You're talking, so, well, so, so in 1980, was since that would be less than half the time. What, but it's not as though the coastal that, erosion has been constant at the same that, rate. The erosion is enormously that, accelerated, that, and, the, and there were permits prior that, to 1980 that required stuff. Well, we'll still well, have to the, the, yeah, and, and so for, so it's, so it's only been a, a fraction of that time that, that the plaintiffs talk about where there's been permit requirements. And most of those permit requirements, to the extent you fill in the canals once you're done, they're still using the canals. As far as the litigation goes, you know, the real question is whether the plaintiffs have a valid lawsuit. There are public policy issues about whether we should change regulations going forward, whether we should enforce permits. but. This has been tried before. The, about 10 years ago, the Terrebonne Parish School Board filed suit against several uh, oil company defendants asking that the oil companies be required to fill in the canals, to pay to fill in the canals. The Louisiana Supreme Court said, we sympathize with the concern about coastal erosion, but you don't have a legal claim, and threw out the lawsuit. This time around, they have the same factual claim, the same factual theory of the plaintiffs, they assert some different legal theories than the Terrebonne Paris School Board did, but I think a lot of fair-minded lawyers would say the end result, if you just analyze the law, is the same as to whether this particular plaintiff has a valid legal claim. Well, I would just yeah, let me, let me jump in here yeah. real quick and talk about master plan. I carried the master plan on the Senate floor, and even though we passed it out there, was the, the fight about the master plan was far from unanimous. Okay, it has, as Mr. Barry knows better than anybody. There were public hearings held throughout the coast, and there were massive disagreements about um, what was to be done, what projects were uh, to be funded, should funding ever come about. Uh, I had severe disagreements about it. You look at uh, my area, Terrebonne Basin. We're eroding in Terrebonne Parish on the, on the eastern front because of one reason. That is the 60, 30, whatever, whatever you stat you want to cook up to uh, talk about why we're eroding. The bottom line is the Terrebonne Bayou uh, distributary was cut off from Bay Lafourche, which was cut off from the Mississippi River. Terrebonne was cut off in the late 1880s, okay? Lafourche was cut off around that time. And I hate quoting facts around, I mean, quoting dates around a man that wrote, literally wrote the, wrote the book about all this stuff. But last time I checked, Exxon and Shell wasn't around in those days, and that's when the major deterioration of the marsh is starting. I say that because the Coastal Master Plan does not address that issue, okay? So let's say the skies opened up and we had a windfall of revenue into the state. The Master Plan does not call for a fix of the biggest coastal erosion problem in that area. So you have to question method and why people are motivated to do all this. Now, La Latasha, I know you've also got some questions about about how we fix this? Um, if 36% is what is agreed upon um, as industry damage, then why not propose a settlement? And exactly. at the same token, if the Corps of Engineers and um, the, the, the levy system um, in conjunction with the Mississippi is uh, to blame as well, why doesn't the federal government take you, a... You put your finger right on it. Okay. And I've been saying this for 15 years. I've been around since 1976. I've gone from brown hair to gray hair, from two eyes to one eye, okay? <laughs> but anyway, uh, I have never seen any governor or any of the United States senators, including the ones we got today, ever sit down and call a meeting in Baton Rouge and call all the interested parties together. And I'm just like you. If you know they cost 36%, and if these industry people got together and they knew we were united and we were representing the people's interest over the special interest, they would come to the table and they could say, how much is it going to cost? If it costs $100 billion and you say it's 36%, well, can we pay $25 billion? You could get something moving, but you're never going to move as long as the pressure in the legislature is to blame uh, the federal government. What amazes me is this. They want them, the federal government to step in and pay for all the damage. You'll hear, well, the, the, the canals and, and the levees are wrong. Well, we asked them to build the levees, by the way. But anyway, we want to sue the federal government now. The people in Kansas and Nebraska and 
and New York and Connecticut and Ohio, they didn't drill the wells. But we want them to pay all the money to fix the coast. Why don't we ask the companies that drilled the wells to fix the coast? It's good common sense, and you put your finger right on it. We ought to have the Congress together. They ought to be asking to fix it. They ought to get all these people down here, tell them we're having a party in Baton Rouge, and you're invited, and we want you to pay your fair share. And guess what would happen? You'd get a settlement. You, like, you know, he talked agree. about those folks from up to Baya that didn't drill the wells. Mm -hmm. They used the energy, though. Well, <coughs> one, one of the things... <laughs> Uh, if you want to look at cost, uh, just one case will give you an example of how costs are, are miscalculated. Uh, the people who were in charge of the drilling of the BP Macondo uh, offshore drilling rig off the state of Alabama um, had problems in their rig, and they realized they were about to lose about $100 million or $150 million if they didn't bring that well in. And so rather than shut it down, they continued drilling and it caused the largest oil spill in U.S. history. And uh, uh, BP's total damage is now, um, I don't know what the total is, but it uh, exceeds $15 billion, which is a lot more than $100 million. And we have these kinds of problems with the damages that the oil and gas industry and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and others have caused in coastal Louisiana. Nobody's looking at what these overall damages are, but they're billions and billions of dollars. And it's good to start somewhere because the state has never taken the correct action to deal with the problem from the oil and gas industry, which is clearly uh, destructive. Yeah, can I say two things that I think are very important? First, in the current annual plan of the state of Louisiana for the CPRA, came out a few weeks ago, there is $61 million to close oil field canals. Taxpayer money for what permits said, there's one in Point of Fur, which you know well, $5.5 million. That was, according to the permit, it was supposed to be plugged by the oil company in 90 days. That was plugged and abandoned in 1983. We're still waiting. There's another one. I mean, it's not just ancient history. There's another $5 million for Marsh Island that, that was uh, abandoned and plugged in 2011. The permit said plug it in 90 days. Now, taxpayers are paying to plug oil field canals right now in our state budget. And a lot of those taxpayers are oil companies. Well, I mean, certainly not all of them. No, and no, that's no. still, it's a, I mean, you're not supposed to pay for that through taxes. When you sign a contract saying you're going to do something, and then you shift the burden for paying that to taxpayers, that doesn't make any sense. And let Keith, me also, well, we were say, talking me, about... Get okay, the professor, sure. So why doesn't the state, you know, at least try to grab some money back from the companies that may be responsible? Well. We have started writing our permits on a prospective basis, uh, started several years ago, to require that you fill in canals. But when you're talking about whether a lawsuit that's seeking damages for uh, not filling in canals that were uh, dug prior to that requirement being in permits, that's a whole a different issue. And it's a whole different issue whether this particular lawsuit states a valid uh, legal claim. I think that a lot, a lot of lawyers are going to analyze this the same way the Louisiana Supreme Court analyzed that terrible Paris School Board case, saying this is an important public policy issue that regulators need to be handling. doesn't mean that the particular lawsuit is valid. As, for, as to the 36 percent number, I don't know if there's a consensus on that. Exactly. That's the one the plaintiff's lawyers are, losing, are using, so I don't think... Well, we use it because the industry <laughs> participated well, in that study. That's why we use that number. Well, there are many studies that put the number much higher and in, in the senator's well, district, DNR says 76 percent. And from what I understand from, from your lawyer, there are areas in the state where you also estimate where much he, less. Where he says it's, it's less than much, much less. less than there are definitely areas where, where it's much less. It varies spot to spot. No and all, question. And all I'm trying to do is I'm saying, I, I don't know if there's a consensus on that number. I, I don't think the studies are showing a, a, overall a big higher number or else. Well, there are, 30, there are 37 studies that. and they all have different numbers, but they all conclude the industry is responsible for a significant, significant part. Mike, do you have a question? Well, the, uh, in 
two, you referred to uh, Governor Treen's quail plan, and then before that there was the first use tax that was overturned by the United States Supreme Court. In both cases, the state argued the state's official policy was that the industry was responsible for inflicting damage on Louisiana's coast. And so why now, what has changed mm -hmm. that as a legislator and as a governor, you have a, official policy to exempt them from paying what has been the official that's state policy exactly, before? That's right. not exactly true. I mean, the first one was true, but Treen's, I was there. Uh, they had all the Learjets flying around Baton Rouge. It was a log jam at the airport. And we had that hearing in the House chamber because there were so many oil people from all over the world there. And Dave Treen spoke for the quail tax, and Edwin Edwards got up, and uh, I remember what he said to Governor Treen. He said, Governor Treen, he, you know, he's, Edwards is a master with words. He said, I heard you got a jet. I hope you got it blue because that's my favorite color. I'm going to be taking your place next time. But anyway, Edwin Edwards was totally against it. Quick, Treen was for it. It never got out of the House of Representatives. So that Treen's plan was a good plan, and he wanted to tax the oil and gas coming across the, the, the uh, wetlands because it, it caused damage like we know. But the first use but tax got, was Edwards' tax, and, he, and it, the, the state argued that it was all, we needed that tax because the, the damage that the oil and gas industry was doing to our coast. Well, anyway, I don't think... Uh, I think, I don't know how, since, I hope they were sincere with the first use tax. I've got questions about it. But anyway, it was held unconstitutional. But there are some other kind of taxes that are, are constitutional that people know about that they fight. Uh, you know, they hate it worse than the devil hates holy water, I'm telling you. Uh, they really fight this. But anyway, Dave Treen, don't, get, don't make that mistake. He tried to pass this, but he never got out of the House chamber. It was defeated handily. Well, Senator, is there something we can do now? Oh, there's absolutely. And look, we're holding... Uh, anybody that does damage to the state, we're holding them accountable. Willie talked about BP and the amount of money that, that they're going to be spending uh, as a responsible party, as well as the other folks that are going to be res found responsible. It wasn't just BP. Um, and Adarco is, is a responsible party. Uh, Cam There's a lot of companies that, that, that are going to be held. Today, okay, we're talking about today, all these things that we've written in the law, holding all these companies accountable, we're not really finding anybody in noncompliance about mitigation, okay, of if any damages that they've occurred. Remember, this is all about a legacy suit, okay? Uh, the, the main question that the state has is, is this authority that filed the suit even the agency to be doing that? The, st the state believes that they should be the ones handling these types of suits. It's a, as Mr. Barry knows better than anybody, it's a tremendously complicated problem runs across uh, a, a, a number of legal concerns that we have. Would you support the state suing the oil and gas companies? Would I support the state suing the oil and yeah. gas companies? Um, if, the oil, if, if there was a specific company that the state could without a doubt say, we have a, a reason to sue this company, and everyone could see it. In other words, if, let's say Macondo occurred within state waters. I mean, how could the state not sue them? You know, you're talking about BP. This is something I want you all to think about. All our politicians got on CNN. You remember when they were, uh, Cooper fellow, what's his name? Uh, CNN. Anderson Cooper. Anderson Cooper. Every night you can see our politicians go down and, oh, this BP deal is terrible. Oh, it's terrible. And every politician up and down the coast, this is terrible. I was amazed by that, you know. And, and BP is minuscule compared to what's happened to the coast. It's like this. It's peanuts. Peanuts. And where are all the politicians now? That's, that's a good question that goes right to common sense. It's terrible what BP happened, but all the politicians want to jump out there then because that was the, that was the easy thing to do. But it's not an easy thing for politicians to take the bull by the horns and, as this lady put her finger on it, if you think they cost 36 percent, ask them to pay not 50 percent, ask them to pay the 36 percent. And then I'll bet you this. If you went to Washington then and you could convince the president, hey, by the way, we've had a revival down in Louisiana, and we're going to, our politicians are going to get together, we're going to ask the oil companies to pay for their fair share. I bet you'd get the money a lot quicker if the politicians across the United States saying, at least these politicians in Louisiana are finally standing up to the deal that we don't have to pay for it all. Uh, Trey, you've got a question, I think, that's related to at least some of the, some of the ways forward. <laughs> yeah, I do, actually. Um, to the gentleman on the left, you said the master plan is going to cost millions of dollars, potentially a hundred million dollars. Billions. Billions. billions, billions. That's even better. Um, <laughs> honestly, but is it worth pushing away these large companies when? <laughs> when? But is it worth pushing away these large companies when all it seems like we're doing is bringing up lawsuits that 
didn't really seem to hold that much of a hold place. on anything prior no, to trying to find ways to fund this big master plan. Well, as I said, the lawsuit is because we believe they broke the law. If you know the law professor is correct, then the, then we lose the lawsuit, and the lawyers don't make anything and lose a lot of money. So I say all we want right now is that it goes to court and let the courts decide. Let the evidence decide. Don't have the legislature intervene because the industry thinks they're above the law. That's number one. You know, if we're wrong, we lose. If, he, if he's right and the lawyers think it's like the school board, fine, we lose. There's a trade association head named Don Briggs, runs Louisiana Oil and Gas Association, who for years, years, has been talking about all the job loss that these terrible lawsuits against the oil industry are, are threatening. Well, he actually, on February 20th, was under oath in a deposition. He filed a lawsuit against the Attorney General for proving that it's, it's complicated, but basically against to try to stop our lawsuit. And in this deposition, he was asked, do you know of any companies that have left Louisiana because of lawsuits? No. Do you know of any companies that did not drill a well in Louisiana because of any lawsuits? No. Do you know of any company that even considers the legal climate before they decide to drill? No. <clears throat> this is a total <coughs> myth about job loss. The oil industry will leave when there's no oil. There's no, something more that's, important that's, here. Yeah, that's Coastal that's restoration. So you start spending billions of dollars, you are going to create tens of thousands of jobs, and they're going to be good jobs. There were more Dutch in New Orleans after Katrina than there were people from New Orleans. The Dutch make $8 billion a year exporting expertise about coastal restoration and coastal issues. And with sea level rising, we could build not only the construction of coastal restoration, but we could build in intellectual expertise we could export around the world to compete <coughs> with the Dutch on one of the growing, the most important industries going forward in this century. Boone Pickens. Well, let's get to okay. Professor okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Well, <laughs> well, I think there's a little bit of a straw man argument here. Certainly, if you increase the cost of doing business through regulation or legislation or judicial action, you're not going to drive the industry away completely and, ha and have no industry presence. But you are going to diminish the level of activity. Absolutely. If anyone who's been around industry at all, whether worked in it or represented it or studied it, knows there are marginal projects. There are projects where it's a close call as to whether this project, this particular drilling project, is going to be approved or not. And if you increase the cost of doing business, some of the projects that otherwise would have been approved are not going to be approved. So you're going to have less activity. And anyone who, who studies economics knows the, you know, the basic laws of economic supply and demand. You have effects on the margin. And companies do consider the legal climate uh, that they're operating in. And is it going to entirely prevent them from operating in an area? No, but it affects the level of activity, and they are less interested when it's a close call in a place where they think they've got a hostile environment. Well, let me tell you about, I live in the middle of Hainesville Shell, okay? I live in Elm Grove, Louisiana. That's the heart of the Hainesville Shell. We had uh, rigs running right and left, right and left. We don't have them anymore. Guess why? Well, natural gas was nine bucks. When it went to $2, they're not going to drill. But guess what's happening now? Natural gas is back up to $6, and they're starting to drill. So it's not about, let me, t I agree exactly with Mr. Author here, Mr. Barrett. <laughs> All companies will leave Louisiana when there's not any more oil, when there's not any more natural gra gra uh, gas to drill. They're not our enemies, they're our friends. But what we are is our own worst enemies by not making them take care of our state. Now, I've been up to North Dakota lately. Let me tell you what they're doing in North Dakota. They're taking a lot of that money and they're putting it up. And guess what Alaska did? You know what Alaska did? They've got a permanent fund up there. Everybody in Alaska gets $1,000 a year because when they got all the oil and gas, they put it in a permanent fund, which I tried to pass in the legislature, and they get interest and they send it to the people of Alaska. Now, Alaska produces less oil than North Dakota, 
but they were smart and they saved a lot of their money. But what do we do in Louisiana? We ought to be the richest state in the South by far, the most progressive, the best highways, the best schools. We've had the most natural resources and we have squandered them. Squandered them. Now, Salvador, you, you also have some concerns about what we do moving forward. Well, not only that, you know, we could sit here for the rest of the program and point fingers and talk about blame, but in line with what my colleague David said regarding the master plan, let's talk about the solutions. And y'all talked about not squandering money. What happened to all the tax dollars that's been paid over the past 110 years that could have been going to invest in the restoration? The fact of the matter is that prior to 1980, and Mr. Shawbear can attest to this, no one considered our marshlands and our wetlands a national treasure. They considered it a national dumpster. And that's where a lot of people, including the locals, because look, I cut my teeth in the industry in Lafourche and Terrebonne Parish. I'm from a neighboring parish, Jefferson Parish. So I'm well aware of the fishermen, the trawlers, the hunters, and the trappers, and what they used to do before the oil and gas industry came. No one's arguing the fact that there's a problem. No one's arguing the fact that, there, it, that it's man-made. But the fact of the matter is, most of the canal dredging took place in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. You're not going to tell me that a lot of that coastal erosion from the Har Safe Harbors Act of 1889 that required the Corps of Engineers no. so to, to, which, what, to dredge the here. river and, and put minute. the national yeah. economy as the number one priority at the expense of our national wetlands shouldn't and must be addressed. But it has to be more. addressed. All right. the, the, the federal government, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, they, they, they're responsible whether it's, you know, the disputed 30 some whatever. odd percent or whatever. The overwhelming uh, responsible party in this deal is the federal government, okay? And Mr. Barry, myself, and any other coastal restoration, hurricane protection advocate in, in this audience, we may not be able to agree on, again, if that wonderful day happens when we get $200 billion to restore the coast, where should the first $50 billion be spent? He may think freshwater reintroduction is the most important thing. Someone else may think barrier island restoration is the most important thing. I'm a beneficial use type of person. Okay, because if at the end of the day we're talking about restoring things, the land and whatnot, beneficial use will do in a day what it might take a thousand years for a freshwater reintroduction to do. Mm -hmm. All are important. It all becomes down to priority and uh, what you're going to fund. I was wondering uh, what uh, the money won or the money uh, with the potential of being won for this lawsuit, is there a plan for how it will be spent yes. in the master plan? And going on to what you said about the Dutch, um, how will that capitalize on our on this state's opportunity to develop a wetland or coastal restoration industry? Okay, first, the purpose of the lawsuit is to fund the master plan in the area of the jurisdiction. That's what it's for. Uh, the reality is what we hope for. We know the problem is statewide. And we were hoping, just as several other parishes have filed lawsuits, and, and I think more parishes will file, uh, we were hoping that there would, it would spark a statewide solution with everybody sitting down at the table. Uh, I think that will still happen if we get leadership from the governor. I think it will happen statewide, a solution, people sitting down at a table working okay, it let out. Let me jump in, too, yep. just, 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 one, just to clarify, point of clarification. Remember, the, the levy board lawsuit is one thing. The individual parish lawsuits are completely different ballgames. Very, but similar in concept. Right, no question. Similar in concept. And, you know, if the lawsuit survives the legislature, if they allow the courts to decide, I don't think the courts ever will decide. I think people will sit down around a table. Uh, it, it's that simple and work it out. Uh, I certainly agree with, with uh, what the senator said and what, what you said. Is the federal government largely responsible? Absolutely. But that does not mean, but remember, we did ask them for, both, for the levies. <laughs> if the levies weren't there, New Orleans wouldn't exist. Baton Rouge wouldn't exist. The petrochemical industry between Baton Rouge and New Orleans wouldn't exist. The port system in Louisiana wouldn't exist. They ex talk about creating jobs. The entire economy of the state was built around those levees. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't have, have to be either or. or, but the political reality is if you expect 
the federal government to write us a check for $50 billion in, t in this political climate. That is just not feasible. It's not going to happen. I support legislation. I support legislation that, that Senator Landrieu has introduced to, to raise the cap on offshore revenue. I'm totally in support of it. But do I think it's going to pass? No. And even if it does, it will bring a lot more money in, but it won't be enough. No, so, it, you know, the people... Okay. You guys, actually, I think this is maybe the first time in, in public square history where I think a majority of the group agrees that maybe sitting down and, and, and coming to some, to some solutions might help, but we've run out of time. This and lady so right here? We started here you on the public square. need to give her a trophy. Square. She's got her finger right on it. <laughs> She's got her finger on it. We started here on the public square. It. We probably need to continue this conversation online because we've run out of time. Um, and so, um, it's, you know, the end of our time with our experts, but I really want to thank uh, Mr. Barry, Senator Chabert, Commissioner Campbell, and Professor Hall for their insights on this month's topic. When we come back, we'll have a few closing comments. That's all the time we have for this edition of Louisiana Public Square. We encourage you to visit our website at lpb.org slash public square. While you're there, take this month's survey, view extended interview clips, and comment on tonight's show. We'd love to hear from you like we did from viewers following last month's program, Decoding Common Core. Jimmy writes, in short, Common Core is garbage. Since when does sixth grade require a calculator? Anonymous writes, raising standards are good. However, when you bring them down to a level that children are not cognitively developed for, it's just going to lead to more problems. And Gail writes, I look forward to seeing more programs like this to quietly inform and assuage the, fe the fears of parents. Thank you for a very informative and needed show. Thanks to everyone for their comments. We appreciate your feedback. Louisiana ranks as the second poorest state per capita behind Mississippi. It's also one of five states that haven't established its own minimum wage laws. Should it? Would such a move help the states working poor or ultimately hurt them through increased unemployment? Louisiana Public Square looks for answers next month. Thanks for watching, and good night. For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or go online to www.lpb.org. Support for this program is provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting.